seven o'clock. Can you stand for the pledge? Call the meeting to order. Okay, if there's any, any additional um, corrections or to the minutes, if not, I get a motion to accept the minutes of April the 3rd. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Get motion to accept the financial report and payment of the bills. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Budget amendment, uh, Steve? Uh, yes, I have two tonight. Uh, first is budget amendment number 2013-016. It's <coughs> recognized $4,911 of revenue from the Peace uh, County government that is passed to the town to a single fire company for the um, uh, the remaining the uh, Senate Bill 508, which is passed through the town to the Sustainable. Mm -hmm. And they've just... Fire for... Rescue Hand with award money. Just point of interest um, that um, this past legislation now, uh, they just increased that to $15,000. It was 10000 or ten. I think it's almost like $10 million maybe. It's $15 million now, whatever it is, yeah, uh, to year. go throughout the state. So that each year will increase gradually over the next four years, they said. Um, and a motion to accept budget amendment 2013-016. So second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion carried. Pleasure amendment number 2013-017 is to reallocate savings from crews and previously purchased capital items in the Public Works Department for the uh, purchase of one desktop computer and three years of support. <coughs> that is for the um, vehicle maintenance tracking system software, uh, the new computer and the software to go with that. There's no new money budget, it's just using money that from other capital items that were purchased uh, and did not cost as much as was budgeted, so we now want to purchase additional computer software. Okay, we have a motion to accept budget amendment 2013-017. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yes, you're saying there's a three-year support. Is that a three-year support plan for the uh, computer that's being purchased? They can, uh, that's for the software, Dan? For the software. For the software. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion carried. Aye. Okay, Ken. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Commissioner. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I would like to give you an update on the water, wastewater treatment plants for the uh, <coughs> month of February and March. Uh, all good things to report. Um, in uh, February, we had our average BOD at 3.9, total suspended solids 2.3, uh, the uh, total nitrogen uh, leaving the plant average 1.9 milligram per liter, uh, and uh, total phosphorus leaving the plant was 0 0.07. Excellent numbers. The performance is continuing to astound me. Uh, some of the uh, highlights that we've completed, uh, worth talking about, is the uh, we completed the uh, uh, consumer confidence report uh, for the town, so the town could uh, uh, distribute that to the public. And uh, we uh, we had a tour uh, last week. We had uh, 27 uh, school students at the uh, toward the uh, wastewater plant. It went very well. From what school? Uh, they are from Mount Sophia Christian School, Mount Sophia. Mount Sophia. Yeah, they're. I think they're in Newark. Uh, Newark. Uh, they they've been here before. Uh, quite a while ago, before I, before my time, they came and toured the water treatment plant. So they came back and uh, it was like um, they. I'd say they were uh, 15 year olds. So I'm not sure what grade that is, but. Like tenth grade or something, or they were very well. They they did very well. <laughs> so it was a really good, really good tour. Um, Hold on. Guys, 
Can you not be talking back there? We found out that it does pick up on the on the uh, speakers there, and it's on the tape. Thank you. Uh, uh, another uh, note worth worth um, letting you know about is uh, we took we took Bell Hill Tower offline today, uh, and um, in in uh, getting ready, I know the town's getting ready to paint the tower, and they're going to do the lead abatement on that tower. So we did. We're going to, we took it offline today, and we're going to keep it offline for a couple of days, make sure everything works out okay. So we did that uh, today. I mean, as far as keeping it down, you know, just for a couple of days, we're going to put it back online? Or? We're going to put it back online in a couple of days. We're just checking. We set the pumps and uh, different pump rates, and uh, right now the uh, booster pump station at the reservoir is supplying the Bell Hill service area with water so they're, they're getting their water straight from the reservoir not from the tower so the tower is going to be out a service for two to three months uh, and that's probably going to happen soon I, i'm not sure maybe in a month or two months uh lewis would, would know that but this is a trial run so we're taking out a service for two days and monitoring we're monitoring we'll be monitoring the pressure in that zone make sure everything goes okay before we take it out of service completely this is like a test run, so I'll just let you know that's happening. Um, the, um, let's see what else I want to tell you about. Uh, a couple of things that we did uh, uh, along with the maintenance at the facilities, we did all the annual uh, calibrations for the meters. That's been completed. That, I'd like to tell you that because that's a, a pretty big is, uh, item. Uh, we replaced the... Uh, watering belt on uh, one of the belt presses till we accomplished that that's been done and uh, also um, we installed a uh, new uh, raw wastewater sampler at the uh, at the big out pumping station so that turned out real well as well so that's been completed and that's about it good and it's going well yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm more pleased. Anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. You had some kids to come and visit. Did you give them some memento when they left? I did. What was that? I gave every every child a pair of safety glasses. Okay. Oh, very good. And, uh, and I gave them some paperwork about water conservation. Okay. And um, I think that was, no, I sent them on their way. No, but uh, that was about it. But. Maybe in the future, if Lewis has time, he can always come over and take a group shot, and then, you know, sometime he can go back to school, and they can duplicate that, because they're young kids, and they get older, they can always look back on that. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. We had taken pictures before, uh, and um, uh, and we have we have some of the pictures hanging out at the plant, you know, but uh, yeah, we take pictures and send them to the school, and then they could post them there. That's 20 years group. from now, a kid could look in there and say, there was, uh, there was you in there. Yeah. No, it's not only that. That's a good we'll idea. Take, we'll do, yeah. I'll make sure that happens. Not only that, Ken, if you can send them to us, if you can take pictures, we can put them up on the website. that would be some, That's some a good, news. Good idea. Yeah. You know. Okay, we'll, we'll start doing that. Okay. Oh, that's a great idea. I tell you, it was a rainy day, and uh, I mean, it really rained hard that morning when I was when I was at that, before I left to come to work, we were having thunder and lightning. I'm like, oh my God, are we going to have this tour today, you know, and... Uh, but uh, they, they, we couldn't cancel it, so I was going to switch it to the, do it at the water plant, and then uh, it stopped raining at 10 o'clock, and it, it didn't rain, and it stopped. It, it lasted, and so we got through the whole tour and didn't get wet, you know. Good. So it worked out perfect, really. Good. Okay. Thanks, Ken. You're welcome. Thanks, Ken. Okay, Cindy. I'm going to try to keep this short. You know, I love to talk, so it's been yeah, a while. Seconds, be <laughs> we're, going to, we're just going to trim it down. So the Housing Authority is required to uh, conduct an annual plan, and uh, that's in, in accordance with the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development requirements. In addition, the State of Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development also uh, conducts an annual um, consolidated plan uh, and 
So the housing authority's plan um, would coincide with the plans, the overall plans for the state of Maryland. Um, and I've included some paperwork for you. And we'll just briefly run through the things that I, I've uh, provided. We had a uh, civil rights certification, which is the only document that we actually have to submit into HUD. Uh, because we're a small housing authority, there's some deregulation and things that they allow us not to have to do, even though we have to go through all the motions of conducting an annual plan and documenting everything. We don't physically have to submit the plan to HUD, we just have to give them a civil rights certification <coughs> to make it simple for us. So I provided a copy of our civil rights certification that we uh, approved from our Board of Commissioners. On the back of that page is just a breakdown of the Housing Authority's uh, income that it receives through the programs uh, that we administer from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We have our public housing program, which consists of Rudy Park, Windsor Village, and the Home for the Elderly. And through that program, we receive annual funding through operating subsidies and capital funding, uh, which allows us to uh, upkeep with modernization. In addition to that, we uh, administer 40 housing choice vouchers through the Section 8 program. And so I've highlighted the three different programs and you can see uh, our, there's a five-year history of the funding that we do receive for the programs. Uh, you can see that there's been substantial losses in each of the programs. Uh, it's been very challenging for us. We've been through, um, uh, for since uh, 2008, um, some really heavy planning internally about how to uh, meet these challenges and continue to do more with less. I think we've mastered the doing more with less, uh, but I'm not sure how much longer we continue doing that. Um, so I, uh, I ha will have an opportunity to go uh, to some HUD-specific training on repositioning public housing. And the title is Repositioning Public Housing from A to Z. And they claim that they're gonna provide you with all the tools and resources necessary <coughs> to figure out a better path forward. So I've been trying to get that magic bullet and they tell me that they have that. So I'm gonna go see, it's free training. I uh, can't beat it, I'll, I'll let you know more when I come back if we're gonna make any drastic changes soon, but I don't expect that'll happen. Uh, but we really are uh, in challenging times, and uh, but we're maintaining uh, and we're doing uh, pretty well uh, because we have a history of doing uh, pretty well and saving up with some reserves and so forth. Is this part two, I mean, it got a big decrease from 2012 to 2013. So 2013, too, and, well, in the operating fund, that's just the amount for the first four months of 2013. Um, but we did uh, suffer, we have suffered uh, cuts for over a decade now, every year. There's been one year out of 13 that we received 101% of what we were eligible to receive through public housing. Um, and, and then... Um, two years later, HUD did a massive recapture of housing authorities' reserves, uh, which is not necessarily reserves that you would consider money that's going to never be used. It was our rainy day fund that we were encouraged to build up by a Quality Housing Work Responsibility Act of 1998, uh, where HUD said there's going to be tough times. Uh, we want to give you some flexibility to do some private things and to earn some uh, some fees and uh, have some money in case you have a major uh, crisis that you need help with. So we as housing authorities performed very diligently and saved up some money to do major things or in case of a rainy day uh, and had some very good plans and someone in, in the federal government at budget time for 2011 saw a great number out there and there was a, a pass back when they were talking about budget and they decided that they would just zip a, a billion dollars out of housing authorities reserves. Um, so that has been very troublesome for a lot of agencies. Again, we're small. We weren't troubled that much through that situation, but it's the little bits every year that are compiling uh, and we're not sure that uh, there is a, um, a brighter future. I watched the uh, Senate or the House um, hearing today uh, where the Secretary testified on the fiscal 2014 federal budget. 
and um, I, I, I'm just not sure where we where we stand um, going forward. There there seems to be support for the programs, uh, and everyone wants to provide the necessary resources at least to be able to maintain um, what we current the current level of services. Uh, but when it comes time to actually see the, the transition happen and, and can you provide the level of funding needed, that doesn't come forward. Um, so we continue to you know fight. As you know, I've been very active with our Maryland Association of Housing. I now serve as the Vice President for Public Housing for the state. Uh, so I represent all public housing authorities, but my passion is for small authorities and even more so uh, to connect our maintenance folks and our commissioners with training opportunities and networking with other people around the state um, that understand uh, the, the public housing crisis in the world and, and, and how we function. Um, but I also am involved with the National Association of Housing serving on their small agency task force and um, that gives me an opportunity to get out and really do a lot of talking about the good things that we do back at home in Elton. Um, so uh, I will continue to do that as long as uh, I'm willing and able and as long as my board members support me in, in these efforts. Um, so I, I'm doing very well with that. So, um, Cindy, how does the federal sequestration we received uh, a 5% cut in addition to 8% uh, that was already uh, on, the, on the block to prorate us. So essentially, uh, we should get up to 87% of eligibility funding. Um, it, it, the whole scenario is very confusing in that the fiscal year for us is July through June. But the calendar year is the, um, the funding year for our budget, so January through December. And then HUD operates on a federal year, which is October through September. Uh, so for the four, first four months, they started out assuming we would get 92% of what we were eligible. And then as February hit and there was a decision about um, sequestration, we were told that we were going to get 73% percent of funding for the remainder of the year because they had overfunded us for the first two months. Now I believe we're going to get up to the 79 percent um, and so I know somewhere between 79 and 87 percent is where we will end up uh, but for the Housing Authority our fiscal year uh, 2013 ends June uh, so it's very uh, complicated for us to try to operate and perform under the unknown circumstances that that have just happened with sequestration and the continuing resolution and uh, so we we try to function uh, in a way that we know we're safe to operate for as many years as we can uh, and hope for the best. You have full um, occupancy? We do. Uh, we have one vacancy right now, which is actually a unit that's under a pilot program that we're doing a total rehab on at Rudy Park. Uh, so, but we do maintain um, as close as we can to 100% occupancy. Um, what our issue is is that because the federal dollars do not make up um, the 50% of funding that generally we would need to operate, um, we would depend on our residents to to be able to pay the, you know, their share, which makes up the other 50%, or by internally generating uh, uh, commissions or uh, additional fees. Our residents have seen drops of income because of loss of employment, um, loss of services and other resources that prevent them from uh, pursuing uh, wage earning jobs. Um, two thirds of the nation's population in public and assisted housing is actually elderly, handicapped, and disabled. Uh, so there's not a lot of room for the families that we serve uh, to have greater opportunities. Uh, and for the one third that is there that we can work with, it's very challenging to try to move them upward uh, with every other resource being cut as well. Um, so we continue trying to uh, to bolster uh, the self-sufficiency of our families, uh, but it's very challenging when they don't have resources or money 
uh, and we, we can't necessarily tap them into to that. Well, that um, don't make sense. Then the government's cutting you back, mm -hmm. expecting you to survive, yet you've got to ask the residents to supplement mm -hmm. what they cut you back, but then again, the government cuts them back on the same token. And they don't have anything. And, you know, the Housing sense. Authority, at one point, we attempted to, uh, to adopt a working preference. For families coming in, we wanted to ensure that we were helping uh, the local families that were working. They already were on a pathway to earning and that we could, uh, they could pay a bigger share because we weren't getting the federal dollars. And it would help us and then we could help further promote their, uh, their future uh, self-sufficiency. And uh, HUD just shut that right down. You cannot actually have that as a preference. Um, you have to make sure the doors open uh, for, you know, fair housing was an issue with them uh, because we wanted to encourage working families uh, before we did anyone else. Of course, we did not want to penalize the handicapped, elderly, or disabled folks that weren't able to work, so we would include them as well. Uh, but because it was a population that weren't, handicapped, elderly, disabled, or working, that we would be blocking out from further program assistance, HUD uh, took exception to that. So, you know, as much as we try to do more to help our families, we're very limited in how far we can actually go uh, unless they're ready, willing, able to jump on board with things. And uh, But what we find is a lot of times we have families that will, that will really hold others back. Uh, because they, they don't have opportunities or resources, and sometimes they get comfortable through the built-in reassurances of our programs. And uh, it's very frustrating when uh, we're trying to do uh, so much more, uh, and you know when we kind of get a blanket, uh, it's not really worth it for us um, to try to do more. So we continue to, to struggle through those kinds of challenges. Um, but one of the things the Housing Authority is hoping to do uh, is come up with maybe some home ownership opportunities where we have the ability uh, to uh, maybe purchase a home through the, uh, that's been foreclosed on or through a bank program uh, that we could get and, and potentially partner up with maybe Habitat or some other uh, local programs that can help us get a unit in, in ready condition. We're working with residents now who have the potential for home ownership to make sure that they uh, understand their credit reports and uh, uh, responsibility and maintenance and so forth. So we, we have ongoing programs. I have a wonderful resident coordinator. And um, I, when I was listening to the water treatment tour, I'm thinking in my head, you know, we should be discussing a tour uh, because we really have a lot of impact with the children in our communities and we're doing so many things with them through the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, 4-H, Cooperative Extension. Um, Boys and Girls and, Club. I'm sorry. <laughs> what was that? Boys and Girls Club. He's yeah. Oh, I, they haven't linked them into the Boys and Girls Club. We have transportation issues. Um, so uh, most of what we do is at our community centers in each of the developments we have the folks come in um, to do the things and we don't put a lot of money into it so we solicit uh, grants and local resources health departments and and so forth will provide up uh, mini grants that pay for just resources uh, for people to be there or materials um, <clears throat> but i would love the opportunity now that we're teaching the kids about energy conservation and how to manage things to have them uh, have a tour so I'm going to work on that when I get back. And I'm sure once I mention it, it'll probably try to happen next week. I don't know what the schedule will be, but that's how fast my girl works. Uh, she is very active with the residents. Uh, so I'll we're working on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And uh, he'll be glad to help you. Okay. He's very uh, good at uh, providing tours and educational opportunities for kids like that. Yeah. I sure will. Okay, so moving along, uh, the, the document itself, um, the PHA plan uh, that we would normally submit to HUD every fifth year, I did include. Uh, it has a lot of things that are really just kind of generic explanations, um, but uh, I highlighted the most important things like who we are and what our fiscal year is and the total number of units. Um, and the mission of the Housing Authority is the same of that of the Department of Housing and Urban Development to promote uh, adequate and affordable housing, economic opportunity, and suitable living environment free from discrimination. 
And in addition to the mission statement for HUD and the Housing Authority, the uh, Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, in their consolidated plan, uh, states that their focus this year will be for resources on three main priorities, which is revitalizing communities, expanding the supply of decent affordable housing, and providing home ownership opportunities. Bingo, bingo, bingo. Those are the things that we're interested in. Uh, we are uh, pretty active in, uh, in working with the state uh, through a lot of housing authority programs and functions. Our housing authority hasn't had that opportunity yet, uh, but we're looking forward in the upcoming year uh, to delving into some programs through the state that are coming through partnership agreements. Uh, and um, there, there may be a lot of opportunities for us that we didn't recognize by virtue of our federal partnership only uh, for a lot of years. Not that the state is going to be in a better position with a lot of uh, money, but they do have some very long-standing programs that provide funding to communities and they recognize our plight. Um, I do know that uh, the low-income housing tax credit program in the future uh, it's built into that that they encourage uh, use of that program for preservation of federally subsidized public housing. Uh, so it very well may be, we've been trying to get the state to build in uh, additional points to assist housing authorities to preserve what we already have through the lo uh, Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. And this year they just revised their qualified allocation plan. Uh, we did not get any extra boost as a result of our hard work and effort, but what I recently read with the 2014 budget proposal and the uh, tax credit program was that there's there's encouragement in there to uh, include public housing uh, as a as a means to help preserve. So I'm excited about that. Um, so the, the Housing Authority has to present our uh, annual plan to a resident advisory board. And that board is made up of four individuals, three of which are residents in each of our communities, and one is a participant from our voucher program. So they get the first dib at reviewing our annual plan and talking with them about the changes that are coming and how it will impact them and giving them an opportunity to comment on the plan. Uh, there were some comments that the Housing Authority received back, uh, most of which were we solicited outside of the plan saying if you have thoughts or ideas about how we may be able to, to perform better with our resources, please share those. Uh, and so most of the comments came back in ways that, uh, that our communities uh, were interested in helping us try to save money. Uh, so there were some creative things and, and we're, we're taking all that into consideration to share with our board about what more we can do. Uh, but we did get some feedback from the residents and I was pretty excited about that. Um, so we had our public meeting to pitch our PHA plan on, on March the 14th. And uh, we had no one from the public attend. That never happens. Uh, but we do advertise it, and it's open. Uh, and so anytime you want to come out, come out and get a firsthand uh, view of it uh, before it, it actually comes out, that's great. You're welcome. Um, and the Housing Authority has adopted a no smoking uh, policy for public housing. And we've been working on this for over a year. This came about from our resident coordinator getting the children excited about not smoking in the communities and they wanted a no smoking policy. So she took off with this policy. Now I'm a smoker. Uh, I was one of the first people that was impacted by her long term plan. She took away my, uh, my little smoker pole outside of my office and they had just put it there two weeks. It was gone. So she designated a spot for me and I have to go to, you know, outside in the weather and around the bin. Um, and, but I said, you know, it's going to help. It's what the kids want. Let's do this. So starting July 1, uh, the Housing Authority will m make uh, a requirement of all newcoming people smoke free in their units. Existing smokers, HUD will not allow us to implement um, any force against them until their recertification date, which is, happens uh, each month families are recertified on an annual basis. So as they're recertified, if they are smokers, they have to sign the policy and the addendum uh, and they're not going to be allowed to smoke. Mm -hmm. been, a, been a couple 
touchy issues with our seniors, some of them that still smoke because they don't like change. Uh, I initially thought we were going to just grandfather them, and I was telling them that, and my coordinator came back and set me straight, so I had to go back and apologize to a couple of people, but uh, they're okay with it. They understand why we're doing it, and it's a good thing, but it was, it was a challenge um, to get them into it. So the housing authority in our programs, we have a minimum rent uh, that a family must pay. Even if they're on zero income, they must pay $50 a month. Um, and we have to offer a hardship if they can't financially afford that. Um, what we find is families that are receiving the opportunity for minimum rent of $50 when we actually go out and look at some things like how they pay for cell phones and uh, rent-a-center things and nice nails, th there's income coming in. So we very seldom have a family that really stays at $50 because we count everything. We actually go and do an inventory in the home, count products, new products, how much they cost, where they come from. Uh, so we always have uh, that ability to determine usually additional income. HUD, uh, the, the minimum rent initially started out as $25. It moved up to 50 in 1998, and they're presently uh, proposing a $75 a month minimum rent, but it's not been approved yet. Uh, and then we also have a flat rent for families who are working to ensure that they don't exceed um, a, a certain rent payment to give them the opportunity to plan. Uh, so we have a cap rent. Uh, and it used to be based on the average of the market rate rent for the area. And this year HUD requires that we uh, establish the rent at 80% of what the fair market is uh, for our established area. So uh, our, our rents are going to range from a zero bedroom being $630 a month as a maximum up to a five bedroom being $1,376 a month as a maximum. And so you may think that's ridiculous for public housing, but if you could find a five bedroom unit anywhere in town, I'd be interested in knowing what the rent is for it. And it includes a basic uh, set of utility usage allowances for electric, gas, and water. So by the time you, you factor those things in for a family that large, uh, you usually couldn't get anything in the area for cheaper than that. So we have one family that it may affect in Rudy Park, which is in a four bedroom unit, uh, and they're quite upset about it. It's not my plan, it's something that HUD requires. So uh, you know we've talked with them and, and we'll try our best to work with them through that, um, but it may be a challenge. Uh, we've looked this year at our utility uh, uh, charge back to the residents for excess usage and uh, we normally keep that right at the same limit that we are billed from the utility company and uh, so we're increasing the rate that we charge our residents for gas by three cents per unit this year and no change to our electric rate and to our water allowance, water and sewer, we've been hit uh, pretty hard with the increases throughout the years, um, and we really didn't impact much of a change with the residents' allowances. We left them the same, so we wouldn't be uh, then uh, doubly um, uh, hit by having to pay higher rate, giving them a, a bigger allowance. Uh, we were already paying enough on the housing authority's side. HUD used to reimburse us for increase in utility costs, and that stopped years ago. Uh, so there is. There's not many ways that we can get around it other than finding a way to pay. Uh, and the families are just being more and more challenged. So this year we decided for the five uh, people families, uh, five, six, and seven people, uh, we would increase their utility allowances to be more comparable to what is allowed through the Section 8 utility allowances because we did a comparison side by side and realized if you're getting a Section 8 voucher, you're, you're receiving a much higher allowance, especially in the water and sewer. So we, uh, for the smaller families, not so much of an issue, but when you get to the larger families, it really is hitting some of them pretty hard. Uh, so we're going to have to, the Housing Authority, pick up that portion, but increase their, their rates uh, or their allowances anywhere from 20 uh, to, in some cases, we went up to 60 a quarter. Uh, for five, six, and seven member families. Um, so, um, 
Uh, Cindy, some yes. of the, uh, what are just some of the, just to, to, to kind of, you know, uh, put a cap on it, what are some of the things that we're doing in town? Well, um, we, uh, fair housing yes, fair housing, uh, in your uh, report, can I give you? you I know you emailed. Yes. You just want to recap. Well, in this, in this in plan, closing, that'd be good. there is, um, information about the statistics of who is currently on our waiting list. Uh, for families uh, and we also in our uh, housing presently in housing um, the statistics uh, that make up the residents I had it all figured out here and I didn't include it with your packet and I think I have misplaced it uh, but basically the 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 family mix is uh, we, we have no um, ability to operate or uh, to discriminate or provide resources to anyone um, f for a specific purpose uh, so the doors open to everyone uh, and we serve uh, a, a broad range of uh, families of different races uh, uh, different sexes uh, different nationalities um, single uh, families elderly disabled handicapped non uh, and the average rent that our families pay are $278. Um, the average income of our families is about $13,530. Um, and, you know, that's an average. We've got a few that make more, but, you know, quite a few that make less. And again, because most of them are handicapped, elderly, or disabled, uh, they have very limited resources, Social Security, and that doesn't change much. Um, and then the the you know we have um, makeup. Did I bring all that with me? No. We're we're kind of split on the on the races of uh, of families that are in. Uh, we have one American Indian, uh, seventy one families that are white, seventy one that or eighty one white, seventy one African American, <coughs> uh, one that is Hispanic. Um, and then the waiting list uh, covers uh, for public housing there are 661 families waiting uh, and it's a broad spectrum of, um, of you know what the makeup is and the information on the second page of your of the PHA plan form breaks that down in, uh, specifically into what types um, the waiting list is not closed uh, the voucher program for our 40 vouchers, there's a wait, uh, waiting list of 218 families trying to get into that program. Um, the Housing Authority, since we were established in 68, uh, we only have 150 public housing and we only have 40 vouchers. We have not increased the supply that we provide of affordable housing in the community. And that to me is troublesome because the need uh, is growing uh, and not just here in Elkton but in, in the county, in the state, in the nation uh, the need is, is growing significantly and we're not able to produce much more than what we already have. Um, the programs that are being uh, developed and, and um, established out there are mainly for a different income level than, than the folks that we're serving. Uh, so I've been really passionate in the last few years about trying to find a way to ensure that either what's being done in, is including at least some of our families for an opportunity to move on. Uh, and I will keep up that fight, um, but uh, the bigger fight is that there needs to be more, uh, more done for the majority of, of the folks that we're serving. Um, to If they can't get up and out of the program, at least let's provide some resources um, to to give them uh, additional opportunities uh, because uh, you know I, I'm really excited about local planning and uh, talking with uh, Mary Jo and uh, you know I share emails all the time about programs or things that I hear uh, I may hear of a program that's a national only um, but if it sounds like it may work in Elkton Somebody that's going to hear from me, I'm going to forward it along, and, uh, and I'm always available. Let's talk about it. Um, <clears throat> but I hope to be doing a whole lot more of that. Is there a way to expand the number of housing units, to build more uh, units? There is, if there's available funding. But is, is uh, the federal dollars. 
Yeah, the federal dollars really are not, have not been there since probably early 2000. Um, what they're doing is creating new programs uh, to, uh, to help promote um, some of the initiatives uh, that they that they're interested in, uh, and by the time a small housing authority could get into that game, uh, everything's gone. And then they go go on and create a new program and call it something new and have a new set of rules that the the private folks are already on top of and out there running to to get up the resources. So, uh, so my my goal is to hopefully bring some of the uh, the investors. And the private developers and the nonprofit developers that have been out doing all kinds of fun things, uh, bring them down a notch or two to, to help us out, uh, you know, in in these local communities because we're going to be here forever and ever, uh, or at least until we turn it back over to, to to you, Mayor, and say, there you go. We can no longer do that. But I don't have any plans of doing that. Uh, but while I'm here, uh, I hope to bring in some resources that will allow us to do more. We have uh, the Homes for America and the Severn Company's uh, project on Bridgewell Parkway is 98 affordable housing units. Mm -hmm. I think the, the board's been invited to a dedication on the 23rd. A, a lot of what's been developed um, locally has been through state funding. Yeah, DHCD. Um, DHCD, and then some of that actually comes down from HUD. Uh, but there is no funding for new public housing, and there is cutbacks in the ability to provide additional vouchers in the communities, and those are the two core programs that the Housing Authority has been administering since we were established uh, and trying to struggle to maintain. Um, the big push now from HUD is to, you know, transform, get out of public housing, and, and call it something different, and that's the great magic pill. Uh, but what we as housing authorities can't figure out is how to do that without the uh, the appropriate amount of money because before we can put forth a plan to convert or transform HUD's cutting that money uh, and so it's it's just very challenging that they can't give us any better reassurances year after year uh, that no matter what we do we're going to suffer losses uh, and it's very difficult to start off on a journey to change something when the money that you needed and you plan for, uh, and usually you don't save a lot of money. If anything, it's going to cost you more money. If you know that right from the gate, that's going to be trimmed down immediately. Uh, it, it's, you can't hardly find people that want to come to your party when you're expecting them to give more uh, of their own resources, so they try to stay out of the game. And uh, and but we we are working on some partnerships locally uh, that we're pretty excited about that will give us the capacity to do more. I'm a very fast learner, uh, and so when we had the opportunity to partner for a tax credit property, one of the challenges that they said was going to always be haunting us was that we didn't have any experience didn't know how to run tax credit, never done it before, and because of that, we may not even be able to get a project because the investors won't bring the money. So I took off and went and got certified to do a tax credit property. Um, and, you know, really wasn't that much more challenging than what I already do. It was a different guidebook, some different rules, but most of which apply, the same kind of principles apply uh, to the families that I'm already helping. It's just through a different program. Uh, so I came back with that and said, okay, next, you know, what, what challenge is next that we can't overcome um, because we're all in here together? No, well, I can say that I don't think there's any challenges that you can't meet because of all the things you have done over there in the years that you've been there. Right. And I think uh, we have a very good person there that knows what they're doing and can help those people and do what's necessary to keep that housing authority going. Uh, I know you've been there a long time and you've done a terrific job and all the audits that went through, you've got 100%, I know that. So uh, we certainly like to commend you on the job that you're doing over there, Cindy, because uh, I think those people should be very lucky they have someone like you there for them. I, I so. absolutely agree with the mayor. I couldn't say 
get any better. We are very fortunate to have Cindy there, and she works day and night. I know that. And thank you for keeping us informed, and I look forward to hearing more on possible partnerships with some of these developers in the very near future. That's right. And I have some here for you. Okay. Proclamation. Uh, proclamation. The town of Elkton is proud to join the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development in celebrating the 45th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, also referred to as the Fair Housing Act. And whereas the 1968 Civil Acts guarantee the rights of all Americans to fair and equal, equitable housing and prohibit discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, <coughs> religion, national origin and was later amended to additionally prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender and to protect the disabled and the families with children. And whereas in order to the, for, the, for the Fair Housing Act to be effective in prohibiting discrimination, it requires vigilance and continuing cooperation at all levels of government, the real estate, home builders, industries, the banks, the lending institutes, the landlords and the citizens. And whereas throughout Maryland, this spirit of cooperation is being provided throughout the efforts of our federal, state, and local governments, and with the support of many community and nonprofit organizations, and whereas promoting equal housing opportunities are essential for our goal in promoting non discrimination in all areas of life and for all of our citizens. And therefore, we, the Mayor and the Commissioner of the Town of Upton, do hereby proclaim April 2013 as Fair Housing Month. And when you stay up, we have come to set our hands and seal the Town of Upton the third day of April. Mayor and Commissioners, Persona. Hicks, Earl Finer, Chabonski, and Commissioner Gibbons. Okay, so that will wrap up my presentation and that uh, we are additionally doing some fair housing initiatives uh, that we've shared. If you have the opportunity, we were rained out on Friday, uh, but hopefully this Friday we'll be at the Elton Alliance. Next Friday we'll be at the library. And then the last Friday of the month we'll be out front on Main Street handing out some samples of Rita's water ice and explaining what fair housing actually means. Because it has purposes. Very good. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you. Before you depart, I think the Board of Education has done a tremendous job with your program at uh, Rudy Park. And elsewhere, of course, we came up with free lunch at Upstow, not the free lunch, the free breakfast for those kids who might have been disadvantaged. And you have a lady up there that worked as a resource person. I know at Alton High School, I don't know if she did it with the other school, but certainly she came during the summers when they had the summer program and mm -hmm. kids were eligible for lunch. She came and picked those up. Mm -hmm. And when we had problems over there, she stood in the way of many problems that was had. So, you know, she's overall, still there. she's still there. She's and, still and, there. and importantly, uh, we provided bus service at the beginning of last year mm -hmm. to help the kids to cross 213. And uh, it was very few kids, but certainly it helped the safety, and it got the kids to school on time. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dan. <coughs> evening, Mayor, Mayor, <coughs> evening, Commissioners. <coughs> yeah. I'd like to bring everybody up to speed on the status of the 2012 road restoration project. We started the project itself in October of last year. We went to about mid-January to do as much as we could. Now we're currently on hiatus because of the weather. We anticipate starting back up again on May 1st. That's what's going on with that. Um, and on May 1st, we anticipate probably two more weeks and we'll be able to finish this project for 2012. The reason why we're to May 1st is because the plants reopen. We're, we're a victim of the asphalt plants, and they open again on May 1st. So that's, we're doing that. Okay. Uh, we're currently, we're also, in addition to wrapping up 2012, we're in the process of getting roads together for the 2013 project, and we're getting that together for, to review before it goes out for bid. Um, I'd like to discuss tonight the change order in front of you for, un for, un for unforeseen conditions and some additional work we had to do along High Street the tying in the curb with respect to the edge of the curb gutter pan with the pavement itself. We have two line items for a total of $11,600. Uh, the, the line items you look in front of you, the, um, the, pay, the payment up 
the, the payment quantities or per the contract amount, so there's, there's no changes, it's just additional work. So we had, we had $11,600 to change order to the original contract value. We have a total contract value of $386,463. Uh, currently, we have about 48% left to um, bill up for the project. So we anticipate that being done within the next couple weeks by May. By middle of May, we, we anticipate the project being completed. Okay. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Any questions? All right, can I get the motion to um, get the amendment to the change order? Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Thank you. Okay. One thing the board, we want to explain to the board is the limitations of the contract. The, uh, the uh, milling and paving will occur between the uh, North Street intersection and, and the South Street intersection. That's the, that's the work that's going to be completed. The uh, area from south to Lopez is not included under this contract. And Locust Street as well. And Locust Street from high to main also. Locust Street as well, too. We're doing that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Locust Street. Okay. okay. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Okay, Lewis. The, um, I have a, a request for an alcohol waiver for the Elkton Alliance uh, for the car shows that are scheduled for April 25th, May 23rd, June 27th, July 25th, and August 22nd. The downtown car shows are on these events. The Alliance is asking that the uh, town waive the alcohol restriction for those periods of time. I would recommend that they do that. Okay. We have a motion to grant the waiver of alcohol beverage restriction. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, motion carried. That's it. Okay. Old business. Um, I just have one. Lewis, you know, last time I did ask about the um, Route 40 traffic signal. Yes. Um, I see we got an answer back um, yes. stating that they were out there and they. Um, for the report provided, uh, the shop intersection found to be operating normally and that there were no false calls for the left turn. Well, <clears throat> I just went out there before the meeting, took a video of it, and actually it still does the same thing. I don't know what, I don't know what they were looking at because there's no cars in that left-hand turn lane and the, left, the arrow turns green and it's holding up that whole other side of traffic for 20, 25 seconds. And then you back that traffic up, by the time most people leave that intersection, get down to Delaware Avenue's intersection, the lights turn in red. So then you've got to back up the traffic in between the two. Well, I understand that. About when I went that. up there, that problem uh, existed when I was there. When their signal people went up there, uh, they didn't, uh, didn't observe it. So it could be an anomaly. Sort of like taking the car to the, to the shop because of a problem and they can't duplicate it. So you have to wait till it breaks down completely. I think this is a scenario where the signal uh, may uh, may do it once in a while, but not all the time. I was out there. Did it for these two well, they want to see. Uh, it's kind of hard, but I got a video shot of the whole thing. Actually, happened while I was there. Well, you get something like this in that video to oh. uh, Greg Holson. Oh, so I'll do that, so they can see exactly how it works. You know. I don't have a video, but. Um, um, well, I can see it, and if people see it, uh, I don't know why they don't. That's all I have. Mary Jo, anything? <coughs> hmm? All oh, business, yeah. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, no, no business? Right. New business, um, just I think I buy news, but just for everybody else know that um, on um, April 27th, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the Elkton Police Department and the Drug Enforcement Administration will be given, give the public its op sixth opportunity in three years to prevent pill abuse and theft by ridding, ridding their homes of potentially dangerous, expired, and unused and unwanted drugs. So they can bring their uh, medications for disposals to the Ex Elkton Police Department, and no questions asked. The only thing they do say, they will not take hypodermic syringes. 
So that's a good job, Chief. Keep it going. Very good. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, um, nobody knows if um, Union Hospital announced the American Nurses Credential Center Pathway to Excellence designation. Um, so we want to congratulate Elton uh, Union Hospital on their designation. They say they're the first in the state of Maryland for having that designation. So that's great. Really good job. Uh, Boys and Girls Club, Mary Jo, was very nice uh, affair the other day. Very nice. Thank and, uh, you all for coming out. It was, it was great, and that all the work that's put into it, it's really nice. Um, the grass bag, oh, you're still here, good. And just so everybody know, I did attempt to try the bag. I did have one, and I used it today, and um, just cut my back back today, but I used the bag and put it in there, and only got it half full, so I got the front to cut, and we'll see how far, but it looks like I could use the bag at least two times. So it's a pretty good there you system go. there. No. Um, uh, well, I only had one bag. I mean, it's, I carry I a bag. But, you know. Make the deal. You fill that one out, I'll give you another one. Today only. Um, Today only. Um, <laughs> um, our newsletter. Are we not putting that back on the, uh, we putting a newsletter out on the internet anymore? Yeah, we have. Now that we updated the website, it's just, it would be redundant to place the website news uh, updates and then place the newsletter on the the because they just contain the same information. Yeah. Well, I thought because we, we were having it there for a while, but <laughs> also the fall and spring cleanup days. Usually, we always had set that up some time ago, where in springtime in April, the residents would pick an area where the residents come out and put all their excessive stuff out there, the tires, furniture, whatever they want to do, get rid of their do spring cleaning, and get it out there. We pick it up. And again, do it in the fall. We were doing that program at what time? So, what happened to that? Are we no longer doing that either. I don't think it needs to do it. Uh, they have an enormous uh, number of man hours and equipment hours picking up the normal trash, aren't you? Uh, and tons. If you see a report, the amount of tonnage of uh, yard waste and everything we're disposing of now, I think people are doing it all the time, not just once a, uh, twice a year. Uh, we can add that to the agenda, but... Uh, no, we did it like on a Saturday so many, morning for four hours. Well, to date, I mean, so far in the month of April, we've hauled 54 tons of yard waste. So that takes a lot of the resources, 54 tons, hmm. since, but April, since April 2nd. But that's not like your regular households. No, that's just, that's just, that just constitutes a lot of, you know, a lot of the manpower, that's why, so. To do, I'm not opposed to it, but I need to set up labor. There are a lot of things I need to set up. I need to take care of the yard waste and the, and the regular service you have to do first, and then I can see what's going with it. I will research it. Okay. I don't think the amount of what you're talking about, tonnage, has anything to do with what he's saying. And I don't know, he just brought this up. Mm -hmm. But I guess he's saying you are providing a courtesy or a benefit to those people who don't put it out on a normal basis on the tracks. If you said to Joe Blow over here, mm -hmm. next week we're going to have whatever, that give people an opportunity to put tripes and all those other items right there, and you carry it off. I mean, you can make whatever decision you want, but you're the one talking about tonnage. It has nothing to do with the gesture that you want to give the community. Understand. It's just giving the, the residents an opportunity in the spring and the fall to get rid of some things that they probably would want to get rid of but didn't know how to get rid of. And this way we can get rid of it? If they call us, a lot of times if they call the office directly, we'll tell them exactly what to do and where, you know, they can bring it to us. We help them out. If we know about it, we will make some pickups occasionally. So. Well, you have to let them know that, too. We got yeah, to that somehow let them know. Yeah, carpet, carpet's the number one thing. If you see carpet out, eventually I have to get it, so that's the number one thing. Which waste management cannot pick up, so I go back and get that all the time. I got lots of carpet. All right, and the other thing I have... Um, Got a letter from Providence Seventh Day Adventist Vincent's Church. Um, they're having uh, they, apparently they have their church along with most Maryland and Delaware uh, Seventh Day Adventist churches is part of a Chesapeake conference of the SDA located in Columbia, Maryland. They purchased two 16-inch trailers and equipped them for disaster relief situations. One trailer is set up as a kitchen where we can prepare and serve meals for volunteers in the disaster area. The other trailer is used as a supply trailer, which was stocked with things like personal care and kits. 
Um, but on May 11th, they will have a, one of the trailers at the local church. And after the 11 a.m. service, our disaster team will serve lunch from the trailers beginning from 12.15 to 12.30. And they're asking us, or, well, it's up to me, but they're friends, uh, asking anyone who would like to attend, um, they would like you guys to stop over and see the trailer and join in the Are You Ready uh, presentation. Where is that? Uh, well, this one, this one's 3085 Singularly Road is Sandy Arrow. She's a coordinator. So, and it's all May 11th. Hmm? Well, any of the churches that we have around town. Okay. Yeah, but if you want to stop and see it, that's uh, let you know. Okay, anything else there, Mary Jo? No? Um, I just wanted to say, um, on Earth Day, I don't know if anybody's aware, Union Hospital and on our own are partnering to go around cleaning the town. And I don't know if they've actually contacted anyone um, to let them know they're doing that. They called me the, the other day and asked where, and I suggested they contact the town, um, whether it be the parks or, you know, so, but they are, so again, if you're here, um, I talked to her again this afternoon and said I would mention it. If there's anywhere you think in particular that they can really help by cleaning up, just let me know and I will call her again. Sure. Because um, they are, they have chosen the town to, to do their project. And also, I, um, Sunday, this is kind of odd, but I wanted to bring it up. I was at Marina Park for the afternoon. My daughter and son-in-law wanted to go and I went back there. We walked along the water. I saw two people putting kayaks in, which I believe I came in to see Jean, but she was out of the conference. Is the is the boat ramp there? There's a, a there used to be. Well, they put two kayaks in there. One had a family with a child and another person. They went down the river. I took some pictures. We played tennis. They some guys were playing basketball, and then before you knew it, the basketball court was full. And I mean, you could not fit, we probably could have had four courts of teams there. And I thought, it was beautiful back there. It was about seven, eight, nine cars I went through there about the same time you're talking. And um, the tennis courts were wonderful. There, it's, it's something that I think, you know, it was clean, it looked really nice. I think we should really look into maybe where that dock is and, and let people know that that's there. Because when I saw the car, I thought, I didn't really know what the car was doing there. My daughter's like, come on, let's go. <laughs> and here they were, putting in the, the, uh, the kayaks. So I was very pleased to see that. I think it's something that maybe we should look at and enhance. I just wanted to mention that. Okay. I need to hear more. Yeah. <laughs> Is that new business? Yep. Lewis, what about the YMCA? Did you get responses from, you, you sent emails out to all of us. What's the status of that at this point? <coughs> uh, I haven't got a... That's okay. Beg your pardon? I don't think I got a, a consensus to have a meeting with them on the 1st. I, if the board wants to meet with YMCA on May 1st at next meeting, I'll send it to George Patchell and have him see if he'll come. That's what you want to do? No, I, I know you sent email out early. I didn't know whether everybody had to respond. So yeah, we know right now. I know myself and Hicks did. I don't know about anybody else, but I didn't receive whatever. What was, what was the email? Things were all here. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Exactly. He can explain it now. George Patrick with the YMCA wants to talk to the town about uh, possibly uh, providing sewer service to the YMCA. You know, we talked about this before. Right. And he wants to mm -hmm. come and discuss it. If you want to come to a workshop, but uh, we're full up on the 8th, and uh, I think the commissioner had suggested they come to a regular meeting, so we don't have a, a lot on uh, May 1st agenda, so it might be a good chance for them to come. Okay, that'd be good. That'd be fine. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't respond, but I have a problem meeting with them okay. and discussing it, so that's it. Oh, okay. There's a consensus. Oh, we'll discuss it then. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. 
I mean, nothing else. Uh, I think you should announce that we're having a special budget meeting on Wednesday, April 24th. 24th. What time? Is it 7 or 4 o'clock? No. 4 o'clock. You yeah. should announce that. It's a public meeting. All right, so we will be having a public meeting on the 24th at 4 o'clock for a budget hearing. Not a budget hearing? Well, not a budget hearing, but a discussion of the budget. What's the time? 4 o'clock. Why is that? All right, for you. All right. Oh, I'll make it all right. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? Okay, nothing else. We can motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Yeah. Second. Okay. This meeting is adjourned. All right.